the guy I'll be talking to got into Northwest University in Qatar, and he won scholarship amount of three hundred thousand dollars in public schools. Mm -hmm. That kind of happens regularly on mm -hmm. daily basis, I think, mm -hmm. because I heard from my friends, like from previous schools, mm -hmm. they they say that they skip some classes, they like two or three. Mm -hmm. so Teachers do, right? Before teaching a child any foreign languages. I think, like personally, the child should know their own language as well. Like mm -hmm. they should speak fluently and they should know some of its history as well. But uh, watching it on the internet is one thing, and, and actually and following cool. that yeah. at the gym is a, is a whole, whole whole other thing. So you need to have someone watching over you anyway. Uh, whatever you are good at, or whatever you have talent for, you should pursue that instead of think that you should work much harder to achieve the certain thing. I think anybody who's, uh, who's playing volleyball have watched that anime. Because if you don't watch that anime, but if you play volleyball, you're not really a volleyball fan if you don't watch that anime, if you have never watched it. The global warming, right? Everybody knows about it, but nobody does a thing to prevent it. Hey folks, hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Adustream News. I'm your host, Muhammad Ali here. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to someone very young and who's done something incredible. So the guy I'll be talking to got into Northwest University in Qatar and he won scholarship amount of $300,000. Can you imagine that? <laughs> That's a little, little over a quarter, quarter million dollars, right? That's a lot of money. So yeah, I'm super, super, super excited to be talking to this guy today and, and you know, find out his story of how he pulled that off. So if you guys are curious, keep watching. All right, without further ado, Miss Mr. Diorbek Jarabayev. Hello, thanks for having me here. Yeah, nice to meet you here. welcome, welcome to the show. Mr. Diorbek, would you like to tell our audience a little about yourself? Um, so... As you already mentioned, my name is Zerbek, and I have graduated school this year. So I graduated presidential school in Tashkent. Uh, and it's uh, Muhammad Ali, like I already mentioned, I got accepted into Northwestern University in Qatar with 300K scholarship. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that, that's like a brief introduction, introduction yeah. of the Arbeck, right, Mr. The Arbeck? So there, there is a lot of material I want to cover with you today. We will be talking about a bunch of different things about your academic life, right? And your personal life. But mm -hmm. before we do all that, what do you say we talk a little about past? So you are from Kokand, right? Um, so the story of where I am originated is kind of interesting. Uh, whenever people ask from where I am from, I get kind of... Um, it's kind of interesting question though, look, um, originally I'm from Sudaria, uh, Sudaria region, all of my relatives and my parents, grandparents are from there, but me, uh, for, from my entire extended family, it was only me who was born in Kukant, mm -hmm. in, in a totally another region of Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, I would say that I'm from Sudaria, but considering that Sudaria was kind of built up after like 1960s, mm -hmm. like it was desert before that. Mm -hmm. um, all of my like um, grand, grand grandparents are from Zaman, mm -hmm. like uh, the city or yeah, city in the Jizakh. Yeah, it's the so, mountain region, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I could say that I'm both uh, from Sirdare and Jizakh at the same time, mm -hmm. but I, I will usually like ask for people like um, that I'm from Sirdare. Usually. Oh, and where, where did you grow up? Um, so, uh, as I was born in Kukant, I spent like first five years of my life there. I went to kindergarten there. And after that, we moved to Sridaria, like the Gulistan city of it. And we lived there like for, uh, I don't remember, but around se seven years. So I spent my childhood there in Gulistan. And then uh, when I reached like fifth class, we moved to Tashkent, mm -hmm. so it's been like six years or seven years already that I'm living in Tashkent. 
Right. And how does your you know experience of growing up in Kokant compare to your experience of growing up in Tashkent? Oh, so um, let me be honest. Uh huh. I have a kind of a short memory, uh, but you know, since it was like uh, I was like four, four or five years at the time in Kokant, I don't really remember anything about it. Like nothing. I don't remember nothing about it, but I can compare it like Gulistan and Tashkent if you want to. Sure. Um, so in Gulistan, so it, it is still not so much like um, growing, not so growing, not so uh, not so growing city. Like um, so in like terms of like m infrastructure and in, in terms of education mm -hmm. compared to Tashkent, like, you know, a lot of. Uh, news, a lot of exciting things happening in Tashkent, but not in Gulistan. Mm -hmm. So I was like far behind the news mm -hmm. when I was living in Gulistan. But um, at that time, uh, we had one prestigious school. Like we had to take an interest exam to get into there. It was called like, I, I don't remember its name, but it had an ex uh, entrance exam. So just like presidential schools. Um, so first, Mm, I think yeah, I think that's it. So uh, how about Tashkent? What happened once you moved to Tashkent? Um, so uh, what was your first impression of Tashkent? How old were you at the time? Um, so when I first moved into Tash moved to Tashkent, it, uh, I was like since fifth, fifth grader, like twelve, 12 years old, right? Mm -hmm. um, at that time, since I was like from other region, uh, from the region other than Tashkent, um, the Guys kind of bullied me a bit, kind of, uh, uh -huh. not like in a harsh manner, but mm -hmm. in a soft way, because I was like from the other region, you know. So what would they do? They would call uh, you? They, they, they will call up like different names, like mm -hmm. um, like if you know. Yeah, what, what does that mean? What's that? Uh, like from a, a person from a rural area. Oh, I yeah. see. Yeah. So, so yeah. They, they used that, that was the case. But I got used to it yeah. because, you know, I, I'm kind of optimistic and I'm kind of energetic and mm -hmm. I'm kind of an uh, extremist, uh, extroverted person. Mm -hmm. So I got along with people around there, no, except girls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. it wasn't that much of a problem for me mm -hmm. because I, um, as I mentioned, I got along with uh, all, all of my friends and classmates mm -hmm. pretty quickly. Um, so after I moved to Tashkent, I kind of started to see my own potential in everything I do. For example, I, there, there are like a bunch of opportunities out here uh, compared to Gulistan. Um, everything that has happened to me, that, uh, everything that's life-changing happened to me in Tashkent, not in Gulistan. Like I, I started reading books in Tashkent. I started to write poems in Tashkent. I started to uh, like networking and socializing in Tashkent. So like Tashkent really changed my mind. It was like a deal breaker, kind of. Mm -hmm. I see, right. So w would you say, w what would you tell all other kids or people your age or a little long, younger than you? You think they should move to Tashkent if they want to, if they want more opportunities, if they want to get better, or is, or is, is not possible to have those opportunities in regions? Um, I'll be honest, nowadays, mm -hmm. it's kind of possible to have all of those right now, but at the time, like seven years ago, it wasn't because there were not like so much of, uh, so much of things going on around, around Uzbekistan, but only in Tashkent. But right, you know, uh, since there are like specialized school and presidential schools have opened all around the Uzbekistan. Now you have like uh, students of presidential schools like organizing some events like MUNs or like any networking events. So you have like opportunities to get to know other people, to get to know the people who are um, willing to study abroad, who are motivated like to study. So you have the mm. chance of getting to know them and you have the chance of uh, extending your network and mm -hmm. you know by extending your network you can like mm -hmm. uh, improve in a lot of ways that you can't even imagine mm -hmm. like so you don't necessarily have to move have to move to Tashkent yeah, you don't to have these opportunities yeah these days no because it's not like compulsory thing yeah so you got all you got presidential schools all all over the country right yeah we have like 14 of them right now yeah plus you got you can network with people online. Yeah, like right. Pretty much. Yeah. So there's fast speed internet, right? 
you can pretty much figure things out yourself. how to go from knowing little English to getting mm. into big universities in the world like yours, Harvard, or yeah. whatever, you know, just sitting home. Mm, especially not, like not, not leaving your hometown. Yeah. That, that's what I meant to say. So, because okay, I know a lot of guys who made it without living in Tashkent, yeah. without going to Tashkent. Yeah. And one of whom I know personally is Mr. Parviz. Yeah. He, he got scholarship to Colby, Colby University. Yeah. And I don't remember him taking SAT in Tashkent. I don't remember him doing extracurriculars in Tashkent, right? He pretty much did everything. He built his portfolio. Yeah, and that's did something his, extraordinary. Yeah, uh, made, built his own college application here yeah. in Bukhara. Yeah. Right. So, and because because when, you, when people hear your story, they might get the impression, well, this kid must be special. He's got all these privileges we don't. Or uh, he's gone to this top school. Or he lives in Tashkent, and I live in Fergana, or I live in Bukhara or Samarkand, and I don't have these opportunities. Uh, but that gone are the days when you'd have to go to Tashkent to get into a top school or get your SATs done. Now you got it all over the country, right? Well, you know, everything has its own price. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't like, uh, what, uh, not all the things were going easy for us, for our family. When we moved to Tashkent, mm -hmm. we've, uh, we've, like, we've lived like uh, half of our years like in rent. Mm -hmm. uh, we rented houses like, mm -hmm. and we changed like uh, house like three or four times mm -hmm. during um, our living in Tashkent. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sure, for a family from Sardaria, it was sometimes um, hard uh, financially, sometimes. Since, um, my, I'll be honest, since my dad didn't have like permanent job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he got, he got it like after a while, but mm -hmm. at the beginning it was kind of hard to survive in mm -hmm. Tashkent mm -hmm. because, you know, everything is much, much expensive compared to any other regions of Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. So we, we had our troubles, so yeah. Right. But those days are over now, right? I'm, yeah, alhamdulillah, this is, yeah. You guys, I can see you're doing great. You got into university. Your parents must be proud of you, right? I hope so. <laughs> yeah. And you got your brother sitting behind the camera right now. And I, we hope one day he'll follow in your footsteps, right? Yeah. This yeah. guy. He's making his way through right now. He, Hopefully. He is? Hopefully yeah. he'll make it as well. Uh-huh. Right. So now what do you say we talk a little about your school? You went to presidential school, right? Yeah. So how is being in a presidential school different from being in a public school? Oh. So what's your school like? Because oh. pre presidential school is a new phenomenon. It's a new thing. Indeed. It's been around for only a few years, right? Yeah, it's been around for like five years. Five years now? Yeah. And they, it has opened like it, on 2019. Yeah. 2019. My, my impression of the school is it's still work in progress, right? Indeed. It's, it's an incomplete project because they, they changed the curriculum a few times, okay. right? They're experimenting they, with different education yeah systems and styles, right? They got some foreign staff, they got mm. some, um, some, some locals working there, right? Yeah, so changing the subjects. A right. Bit like, so what is it like being part of presidential school? So first of all, mm -hmm. um, let me like compare a bit the presidential school to public school. So the first thing is that every student and every teacher, every staff, literally everybody is like, um, came out of exams, like examinations. Mm -hmm. Everybody's like sorted off, you know. Mm -hmm. Like everybody's, um, everybody has passed some certain tests, some certain steps to mm -hmm. get into this community. So everybody's like have some motives or like uh, some. So they're well qualified. Yeah, well qualified. qualified yeah, qualified and their students are like motivated to study. Mm -hmm. So you have this well around the uh, community and atmosphere around there compared to public schools, you know, like. And the, for example, the lessons, like their uh, teachers always come to classes, like they don't miss a class like mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. I don't remember any teacher missing any classes mm -hmm. in presidential schools, but in public schools, in public schools mm -hmm. that kind of happens regularly on mm -hmm. daily basis, I think, mm -hmm. because I heard from my friends, like from previous schools, mm -hmm. they, they say that they skip some classes, they like two or three. Mm -hmm. so teachers do, right? 
yeah, teachers and as well as the students. Mm-hmm. Like they're not, res- um, I wouldn't say responsible, but they don't care about much. They don't care much about the school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but in presidential in presidential school, it's not like that because everybody knows the value of um, studying while you are young and the value of g- having like higher scores and GPA. You know, mm-hmm. so everybody uh, tries to study better, uh, tries to improve, mm-hmm. and on that way like uh, on that path you eventually like have to communicate have to network with others because you have like events going on and you you will have to ask help from your teachers or or classmates or whoever from the school so you'll kind of improve your socializing skills like Mm -hmm. oratory skills maybe i would say Mm -hmm. and uh, your english improves on a way like naturally for mm-hmm. example, we don't really study grammar in presidential schools. That's why whenever like someone wants us to teach them IELTS or prepare them for IELTS, uh, we can't really explain some questions in a grammatical way because we didn't study the grammar. We just feel the answer, you know, just feel that that's the correct answer and that's it. We, we don't know the so I guess concept behind it much. So know it intuitively. You can yeah. intuitively yeah. guess the answer mm-hmm. because you're surrounded with English, so you're... <laughs> mind naturally picks up this language, yeah. right? And you don't know how this happens as mm-hmm. opposed to other schools or public schools where all this stuff is being forced forced into students' minds. And, then yeah. that, that's, and that's not always ideal, I see. So it's tough to get in, right? I'm guessing since it's an yeah, exclusive you, school. It feels like right? below like 0%. Uh, you, you have below zero yeah, percent chance of like getting 0. in. It was like zero point zero one, or yeah, like but that. it's not below zero percent, right? Because when you say below, you mean negative uh, one. Uh, no, 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 <laughs> yeah, no, that's sorry, not sorry. that's it not was negative like below one. zero point zero one, I think. Yeah, yeah, around like that. Yeah, I don't know that this year's, mm-hmm. but the year uh, we got into it mm-hmm. had like zero point zero one percent of mm-hmm. I don't know acceptance rate, right. something like that. So, what do you guys get taught at the school? I've heard. At presidential schools, they teach you what's called A levels. Mm. What's that? So A levels are basically um, it's from British system. Mm-hmm. So basically, um, th- if you study A levels, you can like cover up some credits f- from college. Uh, like instead of studying four years of college, you might be studying like three or two and a half years as mm-hmm. well. So. Um, before studying A levels, we, we go through IGCAC, AS, and then we study A levels. So IGCAC, you study it for like um, when you are seventh and eighth, when you are seventh and eighth grade. Uh, after that, you take AS classes at tenth grade, and then you get the A levels at eleventh grade. So right now, the presidential school in Tashkent offers like um, offers subjects like um, chemistry. Biology, physics, mm-hmm. computer science, business and economics, and mm-hmm. that's it for now. Yeah, and I'm guessing you got some local subjects as well. Yeah, like 50% of the class are like in Uzbek, like local subjects, mm-hmm. the native language, Uzbek literature. So you don't histories. get you don't get entirely taught in English. No, no, no. So that, that's like, half English and half Uzbek, right? Yeah, yeah. So and how do you feel about that personally? Um, how do you feel I, about getting taught half the time English and half the time Uzbek? I think that's the optimal um, tactic, like optimal way of teaching children. Because, mm-hmm. you know, um, before teaching a child any foreign languages, I think, like personally, the child should know their own language as well. Like mm-hmm. they should speak fluently and they should know some of its history as well before learning any other languages. Because you need to identify yourself, you need to know who you are before studying what who other other people are so beca- first of all you should identify yourself you should know who you are i think mm. so and what do you what do you identify yourself as he uh, him oh, <laughs> 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 that's funny that's funny i like this guy he's funny I, I i was expecting something like uzbek yeah <laughs> yeah uzbek uh, uzbek yeah, yeah identify that's yourself actually, like, as an uzbek right like any any guy from presidential school would answer the same way, like Uzbek. Because, yeah. you know, we kind of, um, the administration kind of wants us to be a bit patriotic uh-huh. at times. Uh-huh. Like they conduct, um, we perform the anthem 
-hmm. like every Fridays. Mm -hmm. And I heard that some presidential schools do it on daily basis, like five days a week. So you like get up in the morning and stand in line and sing the national anthem. Yeah, before getting into classes. Yeah. And do you know the national anthem of Uzbekistan? Of course. Of course, like, everyone does, right? Yeah, everyone does. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, we learned yeah. that like we, when we were yeah. in kindergarten, bro. Kindergarten. Good, good. So now, and how do you go about all these, you know, tough subjects at, at your, at oh. school? So I'm guessing you have your own personal study regimen, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so let me just clear it out. Like, and you might want to speak closer to the microphone to so make sure it's picking up your yeah. voice. Uh -huh. So uh, let me clear one thing out. Um, you don't study all the A-level subjects at once. Mm -hmm. You will just choose two or three. So for our year and the previous years, we had to choose three subjects out of, uh, two subjects out of four, the chemistry, biology, physics, and computer science. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the business and economics as an option. So I chose to study physics and biology. The math mathematics is compulsory for everybody. Everybody should take math classes. Um, so let me just tell the story why I chose these subjects. Um, first, uh, firstly, I didn't want to take chemistry at all because I've been hating it since, uh, since getting to know it, mm -hmm. since I got to know it. I, I don't know. I don't like the chemicals. I don't really understand anything about chemistry. Mm -hmm. So I didn't choose it as an option. And afterwards, I, I was left with three, computer science, biology, and physics. At that time, I really liked biology, so it was already one, op one option. Uh, one of the options w was biology already, so I had one spot left, and it was either physics or computer science. So I initially didn't want to choose physics because it still kind of relates to chemistry. Because of my hate to chemistry, I didn't want to choose physics, but uh, since, since I didn't know coding at the time, I thought that I would have some troubles or struggles uh, during the A levels in if I choose computer science um, because there are some codings in it in the exams. So I didn't choose computer science and end up with biology and physics only. Um, so I'll be honest, it was tough for me because I'm not a science guy. I'm more like a native. Uh, I'm more into native language and Uzbek literature. Mm -hmm. rather than science mm -hmm. and I was into uh, more of a socializing and networking events like I would I would be hosting some events at school or participating in them or I would be giving some interviews to mm -hmm. uh, whatever TVs come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen that on your CV you, you listed you named a bunch of different events you've been to uh, yeah. you hosted you managed you edited videos and we'll actually get to that part later oh yeah and for sure even <coughs> uh you know when the presidential schools opened the first time mm -hmm. so mr president uh shakat mirzaev visited our school because mm -hmm. you know it was a new project and it was mm -hmm. his project mm -hmm. so he came to open his ceremony mm -hmm. uh, at that time they were choosing people to greet the president. Mm -hmm. So uh, the story is actually funny because uh, so they were uh, lining us up uh, to get into the school. So only like four or five guys had backpacks with them and one of them was me. Mm -hmm. So there were like 40 or 50 students there and adults near me, like three or four of them, were talking about us uh, uh, why did uh, they were asking each other why they brought their backpacks? Mm -hmm. They don't need it. They should leave it outside. Mm -hmm. And I was like, kind of scared because I was like, uh, mm -hmm. fifteen, no, fourteen at that time. Mm -hmm. So I was a bit scared that they might kind of kick me out or like um, point out at me. So mm -hmm. uh, one of the adults started to approach me, and I was like freaking out already. And when she approached me, she, she asked me if I wanted to, if I could like greet the president. <laughs> I was like in shock. How, I couldn't like believe I couldn't it. Imagine it. Yeah, I couldn't believe it at all. How old were you at the time? Like I was seventh grade. I was like I think I was fourteen years old. Fourteen. Yeah. And she asked me, and I said like, yes, why not? Uh -huh. And after an hour of preparation, uh -huh. the president came and we greeted him. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So when I so you shook hands with the president. Yeah. When you were 14. Yeah. Wow, dope. How did that feel? Oh, <laughs> uh, that. Uh, you know, after that, like for several months, uh-huh. my relatives uh, would come to me uh-huh. and shake my hand. Oh my god! Saying that you sh- you shook, shook president's head. head oh hand. my god! You didn't. You better not wash it at all <laughs> for your entire life. And, um, and the funniest insanity. thing is. Um, I read my own poem out to him. Mm-hmm. I, I wrote a poem about presidential schools. Like, mm-hmm. uh, I don't remember the poem at all right now, but mm-hmm. it was about uh, presidential schools being opened and mm-hmm. it was um, that there are opportunity for, uh, y- for youngsters. And it was like, I was praising, praising the president in mm-hmm. the poem. So I read it out to him. And then. And what was his reaction to hearing you compliment him? <laughs> I think I think uh, he was smiling a bit. I don't yeah. remember like the details, but uh-huh. I think he was smiling at that time a bit. And then he he like had a speech. Uh-huh. He gave us a bit of a speech, like motivational speech. And, and what, then, what did he say? Do you remember exactly what he said? Uh, I only remember the phrase that he mentioned. Uh-huh. He said that we were the um, wait. It was Alton. Uh, no, I don't remember. Oh, we need the English version though, because most are listeners here. Mm. I guess you guys expect them to say I think English, he right? said that we were the golden foundation of New Uzbekistan. Mm-hmm. I think that was what he said. Golden foundation of Uzbekistan. Yeah. Yeah. I'd expect he'd say something like, you are the future of our nation or you are the leaders, the future leaders of our of this country, right? Or this nation uh, belongs no. to you. <laughs> that would be funny. Oh, yeah, one of those uh, flattering lines. No, nah, but something along those lines, you know. Yeah, that 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 line itself uh-huh. like gave me a huge motivation, a huge boost. Uh-huh. You know, the golden foundation yeah. of new Uzbekistan. Yeah. It's right. like the um, mm-hmm. everything builds builds up mm-hmm. on you. If mm-hmm. you fail, everything uh, up on you fails as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was like a boost for me. It was yeah. like great motivation. Mm-hmm. And I think you heard about Saifullah, right? Who got into Princeton this year? So, so Saifullah. No, no, not exactly. Yeah, maybe the viewers have heard about him. Uh-huh. So this Saifullah guy mm-hmm. was also there. Like he was behind me and mm-hmm. he also shook President's hand as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. So, so if the viewers were wondering. You're saying your friend got into Stanford. Yeah. Ah, uh, no. I, I said Princeton, no. Princeton yeah, University. Princeton, yeah. So you, with with full right scholarship. Wow. How old is that guy? Uh, he's the same age as me. He he's mm. be, tomorrow is his birthday actually. Awesome. He, he'll be eighteen. You think you think any way I can have him on the podcast one day? Uh you, you can text him, yeah. You can text him. Sure. I'd love to. Guys, let us know in the comments if you guys wanna hear from the guy who got into Princeton Princeton University with full right scholarship. Yeah, you should hurry because he will leave in a month. He already oh, bought the tickets. Okay. All right, sure, sure. Just give me his contact, okay? I'll hit him up right away. Right sure, after sure. this podcast. So but you didn't tell me about your personal study regimen. Like how do you go about your day? How many hours do you study a day? Because that's that's a big question for a lot of people who don't go to presidential school. They mm. wonder what life is like at presidential school. How many hours do you guys study? How hard do you study? Right? Do you guys pull all nighters? Do you guys mm. say no to birthday parties or oh. family events? So would you guys have days off? Or what is it like? Because um. when you guys when guys out there think when you tell them presidential schools presidential school or name any of the top schools, universities, mm-hmm. they think of some genius level guys who um, just sit sit out, sit on their and desk grind. and just write, 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 study, 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 are always on their laptop cramming. So what is it like being a presidential school student? Mm, for me, it was different mm-hmm. from the other people because, you know, it, uh, every person, every student around me were literally studying um, like four hours a day, like mm. three hours a day. But I wasn't studying much because I cannot study, like I cannot sit straight for an hour and study. Like mm-hmm. I lose my focus easily. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it wasn't the case for me. I didn't study that hard as the other uh, of my classmates or other of, uh, students of presidential school. But um, I would say I said like solid two hours at least a day. Um, and then I would just do some sports. Most most of my time, like 
I spent on networking, like talking to other people and doing sports mm -hmm. rather than studying. I, I do really like sports. Like I used to play football till mm -hmm. 11th grade. Mm -hmm. And currently I do play volleyball as well. And I've been playing volleyball for like already four years or so. Mm -hmm. And when uh, when it was like academic during the academic year, I would literally go every day and play volleyball like with others, with peers. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, more of a athlete guy rather than mm -hmm. nerd. Yeah. yeah. But others, they would really study hard. That uh, they they would prepare for exams beforehand. They would review the materials every day. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't really the case for me. I was kind of surviving mm -hmm. <laughs> in that atmosphere. But yeah. others were like. Uh, just going on their pace and they were mm -hmm. just uh, studying for their own, mm -hmm. for their own sake. But I was just studying there to, no, not to get good marks, but uh, just to stay um, in the top tier as mm -hmm. my peers. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really have like bad re record. I have like 4.77 GPA, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's which too is, bad. Which is pretty good. You said 4.7, yeah. right? Yeah, 4.77, I think. Seven. I, I, I only got like four from math. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't remember the other subject, but mm -hmm. other subjects, most of the, my subjects are straight A's. So I wouldn't say that I was too lazy or didn't study mm -hmm. much, but yeah, I studied for like two hours. Mm -hmm. So what materials did we use? Uh, let's get into that. Um, first of all, it was textbooks. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we first started the school, textbooks were the only things that we used because we didn't know much about the system itself. We didn't know much about A-levels, how to study them, how to prepare for the exams. Uh, after some months, after some years, uh, after we got into this system, after we got used to it, um, we figured out some more ways of studying or preparing to exams. For example, we would uh, search up uh, past papers, like specific past papers and uh, solve them in order to prepare assi for assignments. Or we would just watch some YouTube videos on specific topics or just search up for uh, specific questions on the Quora or like Han Academy, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So we pretty uh, much used online stuff more than rather than textbooks over these two or three years. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing you guys have a lot of flexible freedom to decide how you go about learning, right? You, if you don't want to learn it from a textbook, you can just learn it online, right? Oh yeah, freedom mm -hmm. in terms of studying. Yes, we have the freedom in terms of studying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, we can prepare for anything uh, in any way we want, but mm -hmm. we should uh, complete the assignments, homeworks, uh, right on the time though. Mm -hmm. Like we have uh, teachers give us homeworks as well, like mm -hmm. in other public schools. And, but they're a bit strict about it. Like if you miss an assignment or if you submit it late, they will mm -hmm. deduct marks like 30% off or like they will deduct like 20% from your work, even mm -hmm. if you get like 100%. So if you don't complete like uh, the assignment fully or you don't, you don't understand it fully, you will get like 60% just because you submitted it late. So 60% yeah. is already C. Wow, um, uh, I can tell they're pretty strict about deadlines. So deadlines is the only non-negotiable you got, right? Um, you can't miss I wouldn't deadlines. say non-negotiable because sometimes you have the students have Olympiads mm -hmm. or they have some events that school sends them. Mm -hmm. So they don't really have the choice of not going. Mm -hmm. So teachers understand that situation. And sometimes school does warn them um, beforehand as well. So they will extend the deadline for those specific students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. So, they so we have this big, uh, flexibility a bit. Good, 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 good. It's great you have understanding teachers, cut you some yeah. slack. Mm -hmm. That's that's good. So, and what social life is like at presidential school? Like you told me you do a lot of networking, but can I tell you something? Networking is just a fancy word for hanging out with friends and having fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so it's just an excuse to have fun. So say, you could call a friend. What are you doing? I'm networking. <laughs> so it sounds could, like, sounds like you're doing something serious, right? <laughs> when in reality, no, we have like events going fun. on as well. Like 
I don't know if you heard, but we have like PSMUN at school. We, mm -hmm. uh, and Which guys have conducted well, TEDx, TEDx as well. Uh -huh. Like we have some serious events going on as well. Yeah, what, what's PSMUN? Uh, Presidential School Model United Nations. Uh -huh. So uh, have you ever heard about MUNs? Sort of, yeah. Yeah, so uh, our guys, like the students of Presidential School in Tashkent would sometimes organize the PSMUN like at mm -hmm. times. So what's the life in presidential school? Let me tell you about it a bit. Um, so literally everybody knows uh, every single student and every single staff at the school, mm -hmm. like literally. But yeah, we have some introverts as well, like one or two uh, that people don't know about much. But since I'm, uh, I'm, since I'm extrovert person, I know pretty much everybody and everybody pretty much knows about me as well. So um, at school, you, uh, after the classes, uh, students usually go to extracurricular classes like sports or robotics classes or some language or science classes. Um, but if they want it, they can chill as well. But that rarely happens um, because of the busy schedule of students. So after that, we have like a dinner at 7 p.m. After the dinner, we have two hours like from 8 p.m. to till 10 p.m. to do whatever we want, but that time is specifically assigned for doing homeworks and catching up with assignments. So if anybody has some homework or some work uh, left to do, they would just uh, sit in the classrooms at school, not in dorms. We are not allowed to go back in dorms and study in dorms. We should go into the college bu uh, school's building and study in the classrooms. Um, so people usually study in the classrooms, inside the classrooms, but uh, most of the people just go around and talk to each other or chit chat or just do some sports around. Mm -hmm. um, what do you find yourself doing outside school hours? What are some extracurriculars you personally do? So um, I did karate for like half a year mm -hmm. because when I was young, when I was in Gulistan, I used to I used to do karate, like I did it for like uh, two and a half years. So I continued it in presidential school as well, like for half year or, or a year. I don't remember. Honestly. So they offer karate classes at presidential schools yeah, too? Yeah, they do. Currently they do. They, do. they used to offer ta taekwondo classes as well, but our mm -hmm. teacher left the school. So yeah, we don't have that class right now. Mm -hmm. But we have karate, we have basketball, we have uh, table tennis, volleyball, swimming classes. And they built a gym uh, this year in presidential school in Tashkent. They built a gym. So the seniors and like 9, 10, and 11th, grade, 11th graders have the option of working out. They can work out if, you, if they want to, like three and, times a week. And lift weights. Yeah, lift weights. Like we have the uh, bench presses, we have mm -hmm. the dumbbells, and mm -hmm. pretty much anything you would need to work out and do you have like a trainer watching over uh, making sure that you guys not hurting yourself so uh, when the room was first opened uh -huh. there were no trains there were no coach there mm -hmm. were there were no mentors looking mm -hmm. after us mm -hmm. so school got a bit i don't know worried about us about mm -hmm. us getting hurt mm -hmm. so um the our pe coach physical education coach um they assigned him as our mentor in work in in those sessions in working out sessions, so mm -hmm. he would come up and he would show us how to do those exercises properly and look after us so that we don't get hurt, mm -hmm. or we, so that we don't break the uh, setup, you know, equipments. Mm -hmm. you, anyone ever got hurt uh, during this working out working out sessions? Yeah, I I don't think anybody got hurt. Yeah, nobody. So it's it's good then, it's just because. Because with a lot of kids, like I, I work out mm. three times a week too, and I go to a local gym here, and I see a bunch of young people coming and working out there, like twelve, not that young though, like fourteen maybe. Oh. So if you're underage, you usually have to go there with your parent, yeah, or like, like your a, dad or your or you know, relative, browser. exactly, exactly, right. So, and I think to myself sometimes, like, what are these guys doing here? Right. Because if your uh, technique is wrong, you're gonna seriously get mm -hmm. injured. You might you might get back injury. You might te tear your bicep. 
you might mm. he might get you might get your shoulder dislocated. Yeah. So but you gotta be careful when the, you're working out at the gym, lifting heavy. Yeah. But let's look at it from their perspective, though. Mm-hmm. So right now, everybody has access to insurance, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm guessing that most of youngsters, like mm-hmm. um, 14, 15 year old guys, mm-hmm. teenagers, mm-hmm. Uh, would want to work out, would want to get bigger, since <laughs> you know it, it looks, it looks nice. When, it feels nice when you are bigger or when mm-hmm. you have muscles. Uh-huh. So I, I'm guessing that any teenager before going into the gyms or before starting to work out they will actually search up they will actually have some time to search the things up and to look at the like safety precautions mm-hmm. or the right techniques of doing the things no i know i know totally i totally get it i'm sure yeah. they do but watching it on the internet is one thing and, and actually it, following it that yeah. at the gym is it this is a whole 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 other thing so you need to have someone watching over you anyway. Oh uh, yeah. Like yeah, I'm you a, got it. You got a point. Yeah, I'm, I'm 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 an adult. I've watched a lot of videos on how to bench press, how to deadlift, how mm. to do all those things. But I know sometimes my technique wrong because the next day I feel something See, is wrong. Yeah. Okay, it's not. I know it's not muscle soreness. I can tell muscle soreness from yeah. injury pain, right? So I know that I'm doing something wrong. So even when you do your research, you look up stuff on the internet, watch videos, learn from the mm-hmm. the best out there. Yeah, you got. You, you anyway you need like a gym buddy, gym companion, a trainer or No, I was just talking from friend. my own perspective, you know, yeah. from my own experience. Right. I didn't have like any troubles or any injuries mm-hmm. during these workout mm-hmm. sessions. So, um, I was just guessing that mm-hmm. everybody uh, mm-hmm. would have the same path, mm-hmm. would have the same. Um, mm-hmm. same thing as me going on. Yeah. Like yeah. searching up and not doing the mistakes that yeah. were mentioned on the videos. Yeah, 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 right. Anyway, it's pretty awesome that you guys have your own inbuilt gym. N- n- not many schools have schools have their yeah, own yeah, inbuilt yeah. gym. That's we were pretty impressed ourselves as well. <laughs> like we didn't know that, we're, okay. uh, that they were actually building a gym. Mm-hmm. And you know what's even more impressive than that? We what's have a gaming room. Gaming room. We have like six um, pretty pretty strong pre, uh, PCs, and we have like uh, two PS5s. So, wow, yeah. that's uh, even more impressive. That's it, even more fascinating. It, it is. It is that you can so you can actually after class go to that room and uh, play video games. Um, or I was gonna say that we have a schedule. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, when, when oh, they let me guess, yeah. every every time it's time to game to, to play games, that room gets packed with uh, students. <laughs> um, kinda, kinda. It depends on which class you study. Oh. For example, um, they have um, arranged times for every class. For example, on Mondays from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., 11th graders use the room, the mm-hmm. gaming room. Mm-hmm. So. 11th graders, as you know, they're preparing for college or they're preparing for their A-level exams. So not all, um, much of them come to gaming room. They don't play games at all, mm. most of them. But I used to play games. Uh, but it's different for fifth and sixth gra- graders. They don't have anything to do. So all 20, 24 or like 20 of them would come into, rushing into the room, uh, like uh, wanting to take the uh, place before anybody comes mm-hmm. so it would get really messy when the lower grades come when mm-hmm. it's their turn to play the games mm-hmm. so it depends on which class are you like it's about priorities right you know? right like a lot of graders don't want to uh, waste their time on playing visa games that mm-hmm. they uh, don't benefit at all from yeah, what was your favorite game to play on computer or console uh i, I don't play console at all mm-hmm. i only play pc games mm-hmm. i only use the pc um so my favorite game of all time is Counter Strike. Mm-hmm. I've been playing it like for two years. Mm-hmm. I don't play any other games. I just only play mm-hmm. Counter Strike. That's so it. So you like shooting games, right? Yeah, but <laughs> I wouldn't say shooting games because it's too general. Mm-hmm. Um, I just like Counter Strike because when you mention shooting games, other uh, people might think of Fortnite or I don't know Valorant. Mm-hmm. But I don't like those childish games. And why not? Because their graphics look really childish. And, you know, Counter-Strike really requires um, requires a skill. 
you need real you need to practice you need to train for your aiming for your movement you need to uh, know how to properly counter strafe you need to learn how to pick you need to learn the spray patterns of each weapon mm -hmm. so it really takes much long and time to get better at cs than other, any other games mm -hmm. like if you are good at cs you can be uh, you will definitely be good any other sh in any other shooting game for example uh, cs pros just um, switch uh, their uh, like pass to valorant and they instantly get like the best highlights of the of their lifetime because valorant is really easy it's really easy to play when you are um, good at CSGO, CS, because it really requires some technique and some skills, mm -hmm. some uh, me mechanics to learn. To and I'm play. guessing you also need to have incredible reaction time. Mm, yeah, you need every to shooting reactive, game right? requires a. Yeah, I see. It sounds a lot of fun being part of presidential school, right? Now I feel like going back to school. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, me myself. Even even though I graduated like one and a half months, uh, two months ago, I still want to go back to school. I mm -hmm. still want to study there. I miss it already. Uh, but you got new adventures coming up, right? Yeah, yeah. Northwest yeah. University oh. in Qatar, waiting, right? So yeah. you want to? What do you say now? We get into your university experience, getting getting into university. So first thing I'm curious to know is, what was your reaction to getting in? Oh yeah, it's it's really interesting. It's really interesting. Sorry. So let me give you, you like background information mm -hmm. before I tell you my reaction. So I applied to like fifteen universities or so mm -hmm. through, through Common App, and so the decisions were coming out one by one. I most uh, like fourteen of them were I applied in regular decision, and one of them uh, to. Uh, I think it was Washington Lee University. I applied to it in early decision too. So obviously the Washington Lee University decision came out the first and I opened the le uh, letter and it was rejection. And after that, uh, I was followed with 10 rejections mm -hmm. and three wait lists. So the you know, uh, Northwestern Qatar was the last option left uh, so its results were coming out like on uh, at the end of March, yeah, like 27th or 28th. So um, let me talk about the day I got the decision. So it was Sunday, I think. Yeah, it was Sunday. So usually during the academic year, uh, since we have the dormitory in presidential school, we should uh, come to school on Sundays and go back to home on Fridays. We should leave the school on Friday. So it was Sunday, I came, to, I came to school. It was already late, like it was seven or 8 p.m. And I was and I was sitting in a classroom doing my homework. And the classroom was dark because, you know, I like dark, dark room rather than like light rooms. But it was a total dark because the corridors lights were on. So I was sitting there and I got an email saying that my Northwestern Qatar University decision got uh, is out. So I clicked on the email, I read the email, and I was um, a bit, I don't know, shocked because I I was expecting um, the results from Northwestern Qatar like in, in a week or two because they said that it would come out in early April. So then I um, clicked on the link which led me to application portal. So I logged into application portal and I was sitting there for like 10 minutes. I couldn't open the decision letter because I got already so many rejections and it was like the final, um, it was like the final uh, decision, decision maker kinda, because if I didn't get into that university, I would have to study in Uzbekistan, I would have to stay in Uzbekistan. But at that, at that time, I didn't want to uh, stay here. I wanted to uh, study abroad. I wanted to have some adventures abroad. abroad. So I just uh, sat there like for two minutes straight, and then I opened the decision letter. You know, uh, when you get accepted, the decision letter, the first word that appears on it would be congratulations. Uh, but if you get waitlisted, deferred, or rejected, it, it would say dear applicant name. So on the decision letter, it was written dear Dior Beck. So I already lost all of my hope. 
But I was reading, uh, I kept reading through the letter and it said that I got accepted and with full merit scholarship, I was in a big shock. I just stayed there speechless for several minutes. Even the guy uh, sitting next to me, not said, not said it. He was my classmate. So he asked me if anything was wrong. And I said him that I got accepted into Northwestern with full merit and he congratulated me and so on and so on. And then I went to call my parents. I called them. I called my mom first uh, and told her about my acceptance. So you could, you could imagine how happy she was about it. Like she knew that I really want to study abroad and especially in Qatar because um, most of my colleges that I applied were located in US, only this university was in Qatar. And as you know, that Qatar is a Muslim country and I really, really want to study in a Muslim country rather than US because you know, the surrounding society, I don't like it very much in US. So she was pretty like over the moon that I got accepted into Qatar, uh, into Qatar's university. And then I told my dad about it and that, that was it. I was really like, I couldn't believe that I got into this university. I couldn't believe it for like two months straight. Even after I got my email, uh, official email of official university's email, mm -hmm. even though I already communicated with the university staff, I already had the Zoom meetings. I couldn't believe that I got in. I, I was just constantly thinking that it might be fake or uh, it might be a mistake that, I got, that mm. I got in, but Alhamdulillah, it's not a mistake. So now I got to study there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It must have felt so surreal getting did, into that it university, did. right? It, it did. So would you, do you want to walk us through the process of getting into that university? What are the things you did leading up to that moment? Right. Um, okay, like let's start from, uh, from the beginning. Uh, first of all, let me mention that Northwestern University offers only two majors, mm -hmm. communication and journalism. So it's mostly journalism oriented university, like mm -hmm. campus. So every, uh, almost every of my uh, extracurriculars were related to journalism. Like I was a radio broadcaster at school for two years. I was a part of PR club. I was a filming assistant and I had some articles published on national magazines, some poems got published on national magazines, and we have a, uh, our own school magazine at school called Projector, and I was like a um, member of the team, and I even translated an issue into Uzbek. Like, it, uh, it comes out in English, but we have some translators translating it into Uzbek as well. So I was part of the team, and. I even translated an issue into Uzbek. So most of my extracurriculars are journalism oriented. So you, it, I already had like better chances of getting into that university since, you know, the extracurriculars because of them. And then um, I also submitted my alts as well. So it's not, I wouldn't say it's that uh, high. I got like 8.0 alts. You said you got eight in your first attempt. Yeah, it's my, it was my first attempt. That's pretty impressive. Come on, buddy. Uh, How old were you at the time? Uh, I think I was 16. 16. At the time. That's, that's not. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me, guys? Eight for a 16 year old. That's, that's, that's something. Uh, that's what's up. Uh, I don't know, man. Uh, and then um, I didn't submit any SATs mm -hmm. because they didn't require any. Mm -hmm. Oh, you don't have, you, you haven't done your SATs. I have, but it's not in the level of submitting it to universities. It's not that high. So you got into Northwest University in Qatar without SAT. Yeah, without SAT. So it is possible yeah, to it get is into possible. It is possible. top universities without SAT. Yeah. And yeah. I wouldn't say that my essays are that great. Mm -hmm. So I would say that without any SATs, you can still get into top mm -hmm. university. Mm -hmm. So you should just have that passion. Like in anything you do, mm -hmm. you should do it just for yourself, just out of your interest. Mm -hmm. Because any extracurricular I did, was pure uh, out of my interest because I didn't, at that time, I didn't know that I should have these extra curriculars in order to get into university. Mm -hmm. uh, like I, uh, I got familiar with the applications like when I started 11th grade. Before that, I didn't know anything about applications at all, like anything. Um, so 
it was kind of hard for me to write essays because you know I didn't know anything about applications as I mentioned. Uh, I didn't read any essays before. I didn't prepare for anything. So uh, me applying to colleges was a bit strange because uh, most of the people would apply on early action because you know you'll have better chance of getting in if you apply early action rather than regular decision. So uh, during this summer, the last month on August of summer, I start to get uh, get to know the application process. So I prepared my common app a bit, the parts that I could fill in. So I prepared my common app and I had to write my personal statement as well, the motivation letter, some, some people call it. So I had to write it uh, and I kept delaying it. I kept procrastinating about it. Uh, so I wrote it like after three months I didn't write it for in September, during October, during November. I didn't write anything. So I, uh, so the application deadline for early action was first of November. So I didn't have my essays ready, so I couldn't apply. And the regular edition was my only hope. But still, I kept procrastinating, procrastinating. Uh, and when there was like one and a half weeks, uh, one and a half weeks left till the application deadline. The application deadline is on January 1st. So I had like a half, uh, a, month, uh, a week and a half left till the application deadline. And I started to grinding on those application essay, uh, on those essays, like applying into 15, uh, applying to 15 colleges in one and a half weeks. It's, it must be crazy. It's a, it's a crazy experience because I didn't sleep much at that time. Whenever I woke up, I sat on my computer, wrote essays, um, paraphrase them, edit them, looked up how to write them properly, searched up for some advices and so on, so on. So for one and a half week, I didn't get up from my computer at all. I was just grinding on my laptop. I just applied to 15 colleges in a one and a half week because of me procrastinating because of me delaying everything. So the, during this entire process, did you have some kind of a mentor guiding you or instructing you? Or you figured it out by yourself? Mm. On, on so your, on like your, 70 or 80%, uh, so 70 or 80% of the things I figured it out myself. Uh -huh. So other 20% was help of uh, help from Saifullah and Abdelaziz. Mm -hmm. I think you heard about Ablaz, right? He got into, he got accepted into Harvard with Fulbright this year. Wow. So those are like my... Um, do, do you guys go to the same school? Yeah, they, they also graduate from presidential school uh -huh. this year, uh, from Tashkent. Uh, any chance I can have them on the podcast, both of them on the podcast one day? Uh, sure, sure. You can contact yeah. them about it. Yeah. So I got really a lot of help from them because, mm -hmm. um, for example, Ablaziz mm -hmm. helped me to rephrase or help me to... Uh, get the extracurriculars uh, into a better shape, into mm -hmm. a better looking uh, format, you know. And Saifullah really helped me with um, the whole application itself because I had some questions, I had some troubles, and whenever I had them, I would ask Saifullah and he always was ready to help. So I um, only two people I got help from are Ablaz and Saifullah from my peers, and mm -hmm. that's it. And Saifullah even read my personal statement and he gave some feedback about it. Since, you know, application deadline was a week, uh, uh, a, week off, uh, a week left till application deadline, um, I couldn't really rewrite my whole personal statement because as I mentioned, it wasn't that great. It was okay. Even Saifal said that it was okay. It wasn't great, it was nice, it was okay to submit. So I didn't have time to edit it, so I just submitted that okay personal statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. And you got in. You got in. Yeah, yeah. You, you didn't just get in. You also won a scholarship, which is a big deal, kind of a big deal. Yeah, you could say <coughs> that. Right. Yeah, it must have been. How about your extracurricular? So you had your extracurriculars already figured. You said you yeah. were involved in different events and you yeah. did photo editing, video editing, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I did that too. Right? So, so you, do you want to talk about that as well, that experience? So uh, when did you start? editing photos and videos? Uh, um, so during the summer break, mm -hmm. I really wanted to get a job, mm -hmm. uh, not because of financial need, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. but because I want to get to know how it feels to be an adult, mm-hmm. so how it feels to work mm-hmm. for for yourself, mm-hmm. how it feels to earn your own money. So I applied to as many positions as possible through some online websites. I don't remember the, how they're called right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first job I got was a football man, uh, no, 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 stadium, ma- stadium manager. I looked after the stadium and whenever people came to play in, mm-hmm. I would give them the ball. And after finishing the game, they would uh, pay me the rent and I would collect the rent uh, mm-hmm. and I would send the money to the ad- uh, administration in um, after a week or after months. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I the first job was that for, first job I had was that and then after that I got bored of uh, I got bored of that job because you know I was just wasting so much time on it because you, I, I was just sitting there and watching people play football that was it you could have joined them uh, <laughs> no I didn't no, think just, of that at just, the time just, just kidding okay uh, yeah, they probably then, wouldn't let you in right? <laughs> uh, so I got bored of it mm-hmm. and then I asked the administration if they had any other uh, positions mm-hmm. uh, and they said that they have a free position at video, video editing and so on so on and then I applied to there they accepted me and I start to edit their football videos mm-hmm. the company uh, is only the company is dedicated to football they host football tournaments they host like uh, championships or so on so on and they have some social media pages so I had to Photoshop some of their uh, posts and I, ha- I had to write some of their posts and I had to uh, edit their videos as well. Like they would record their championship, their matches, and I would sit and watch all the games, like edit the parts that, I, that were needing an edit. Mm-hmm. And I would maybe like change the score lines at times and put some effects around it. Uh, just play it around the video a bit. And what, what kind of software do you use? video editing software mm, so when i had a better pc uh i used to use uh i used to have like pre- uh, adobe premiere uh-huh. but after that computer was gone was broken uh i switched to filmora because it was kind of uh, more easy to use and it had like uh, easier interface and it had like a bit more features than any other video editing softwares I ever used. So yeah, mm-hmm. I used Filmora as well. And where did you learn how to use uh, online those apps? That are YouTube. That are YouTube. On Tutorials. YouTube, you learned. You were all self-taught. You taught yourself yeah, how to yeah, edit yeah. videos. I didn't go to any yeah. like mentors or any study centers. Mm-hmm. I just learned them by myself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's that's. That's awesome. That, you know, that's great quality to have. I wish a lot of teenagers had that taking initiative. Oh. They're now waiting for someone to come and tell you or teach you or guide you, but just going and figuring things out on your own. Uh, because, right? uh, you know, um, have you always had this quality? Like learning things on my own? Yeah, just or wanting to do stuff. Yeah, Cause, cause, I had that from some, some young people don't have that initiative, sense of initiative. I, yeah. have, I should be doing this. I should be doing that. I should try this. I should uh, go and do that. You know so what? They don't, they, um, don't do, they don't do stuff unless uh, they're told by their parents or uh, their yeah. teachers. Oh, you know what my, my mom says? Mm-hmm. See, she says that I was more energetic and more easygoing and more planned when I was a child mm-hmm. than I am right now. Oh, you're, Because, you know, when I was... In Gulistan, when uh-huh. I studied there for like five years, right? I studied there for five years. At that time, I did everything myself. I did the homeworks myself. I didn't ask any help from my parents. Like, you know, usually the when you are in first or second grade, mm-hmm. ch- children would need their parents' help. But somehow, I didn't need their help at all. I managed to do all of my homeworks myself. Mm-hmm. And then I got enrolled into some clubs as well. Like, I had... Uh, Part of I, I was part of a music club, uh, and I started to carry to myself as well. So I was really like easy going, and I was really like um, trying everything that I could uh, and grabbing as many opportunities as possible when I was a kid. But my mom said that that flame that that was that I used to have now is gone. 
not, she says that not, pretty not, much. Not, not exactly, yeah. because if that fire was gone, when Parviz texted you and your other friends, uh-huh. inviting you to this podcast, if you didn't have that fire, you would have said no, but here you are. Yeah, you, also talk, you, yeah. you, you traveled, you came all the way down from Tashkent to Bukhara to be on this podcast, and that must mean something. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's a really cool experience for me since mm-hmm. I want to become a journalist, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, since you're already like experienced in this field, mm-hmm. in this uh, podcasting thing. No, I'm still a work in progress. But you already have like a big, huge experience though. Mm-hmm. So I could learn a thing mm-hmm. or two from you as well. Mm-hmm. And before hosting any broadcast, mm-hmm. uh, podcast, you should first be a guest uh, on it, you know, before hosting any podcast. Because you should know how the guest feels before asking them or uh, mm-hmm getting them into a conversation mm-hmm. so i really want needed this experience yeah I would that, say. That, that's true though i i went on like several podcasts before finally started the, this podcast yeah. i was on edu action podcast like three times edu action oh Ed, that's impressive edu edu podcasts they had their edu oh, podcast yeah, yeah. like when i got my first nine second nine and then third time they had niners edition podcast you must have been to many podcasts yeah, yeah right. like it like a few yeah, I was guest on several, several podcasts. Uh, I'm going to be going on another podcast in Tashkent soon, but that's that, that's a secret now. Okay. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. So We'll keep you guys updated. Just follow the channel, okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, for sure. <laughs> right. And what do you say we talk about your university major? You said you want to study journalism, right? Yeah. And so, I kind of get it. I kind of get it. Why you want to become a journalist? Because you have passion for yeah. reporting. You have passion mm-hmm. for being involved. You have passion for Writing. networking. Yeah. Right. All these things. Right. Mm-hmm. So, what kind of journalist do you want to bec- become? Because it's a, there, there are different kinds of journalists. Mm-hmm. You have detective journalism. You have a political journalist. You have TV correspondent. You have a, a podcaster. Mm-hmm. I, I, are, are podcasters journalists? Yeah, like I, broadcasters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Broadcast. You call them broadcasters. Yeah, I, I would call them like that. Uh huh. Um, so, what kind of journalist do you want to become? I have no idea. No, no yeah. idea. That that. Yeah. Why do you think I, I'm attending a college? I want to mm-hmm. figure out what kind of journalist I want to become. You know, yeah. I want to see the opportunities. I want to see and compare everything mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where, uh, when I I go to university. Mm-hmm. I want to see. I want to feel them myself. Yeah. Be- before deciding what to pursue. Right. right. And. Let me tell you a funny story about it, sure, how I sure. got involved in the journalism. Totally. So when I started the senior year at presidential school, the 11th grade, when I started it, I was really hooked up with biology. I was really loving it. I was reading it like daily. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a case for me that it wasn't a case for me studying something daily. Mm-hmm. But somehow I got interest in biology and I started to study daily and I... Um, I start to take notes as well. That's uncommon in presidential school. Nobody takes notes. But uh, I start to take notes. I start to take biology seriously. Mm-hmm. And I got like pretty high scores on tests as well. Mm-hmm. So it was uh, really near uh, the time of application process. So I had plans of applying to some biology related majors, some molecular biology or bi- bioengineering. I had these options and I really wanted to apply to them. But after I told my mom about my plan, we re- had a like four or five hour talk about my future, about my, about what I want to pursue in university. So the thing she suggested me was that uh, whatever you are good at or whatever you have talent for, you should pursue that instead of think that you should work much harder to achieve the certain thing because you know if i want to become the best in biology or in biology field in biology related field i really need to grind i really need to study like 24 7 but bio uh, journalism comes like naturally to me um, because you know my grandparent um, my grandpa was journalist as well he was like a reporter uh he used to work in the national magazine like national newspaper um so i got i got this um let's say like ability mm-hmm. let's this talent from him so it runs in the family this quality yeah, yeah, runs in the family you could say that uh so i after that conversation i changed my mind that i want to pursue the thing that i'm already good at that i already have a talent for 
But biology, I was recently hooked up and it was still hard for me, even though I studied a lot. It was still hard because, you know, biology is really a huge field. You can't um, learn the most of it like uh, in a year or two or like during your college year as well. And if you want, if I wanted to pursue a biology related field, I would have to uh, study masters and I would have to uh, get PhD as well. So uh, I thought that it was really long process and really, I thought that it was a time wasting kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, so I changed up my mind and decided to apply to journalism major. So yeah, that conversation changed a lot. Basically my future. Mm -hmm. So what are your expectations going to Northwest University in Qatar? Well, what do you think the place is going to be like? Mm, hot. Hot. <laughs> for yeah, sure, right? yeah, for sure. Like Qatar is one of the hottest countries in the world. Mm -hmm. For example, like in 2023, the lowest temperature Qatar had was like 19 degrees, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's really a real hot country. It will be a real hot experience. Mm -hmm. But other than that, uh, I really like the campus a lot because inside the building it has its own the university has its own museum dedicated to journalism and at this university the university itself hosts a lot of major events related to journalism like many professors around the world like from Yale or from sometimes from Harvard come to Uni Northwestern University in Qatar just to participate in the forums in those events so I th I'm guessing that I really have like, I will really extend my network a lot and I will uh, surely connect with some uh, high tier professors as well, just to uh, get a glimpse of what they're doing and what it actually feels like uh, to work in this field. So I'm guessing that I will really be, uh, I don't know, I will really get to know journalism a lot when, once I go there. Yeah, a lot of adventures waiting ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping so. Yeah, I'm super excited for you, buddy. And I really hope next year when you're back in Uzbekistan for your summer break, you'll come on the podcast again and share. Oh, well, sure. If you want, I would love to uh, come. Of I'd course. Love to come. Yeah, yeah. I'd love there to will be many things podcast. going on. Like many things have, have, have already be happened in a year. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it will be really interesting. Yeah, for sure. And so, do you have any hobbies outside? academics like you, you told me you like karate and yeah. your cv says you like playing bat volleyball as well right yeah yeah so let's talk about volleyball mm -hmm. because that's the most favorite thing mm -hmm. that uh that i like to do mm -hmm. the most favorite sport of mine is volleyball uh so it's been already four years since i started to play volleyball at school mm -hmm. so uh those years not many of my peers were playing playing it only like seniors 11th and 10th graders I was like 8th grader at that time so I was really hooked up with them uh, because you know most of the seniors were really tall like like they were one one eight one eight or one eight five meters so it was really coming easy for them and I wanted to challenge myself so uh, I started to play with them uh, I started to play against them and then uh, after getting interested in it, I started to practice. I started to watch videos, practice videos, tutorials. So after practicing, practicing, and much, much more practices, uh, I got accepted. Like I got into school's varsity team, volleyball varsity team, when I was in ninth, ninth grade. Um, yeah, we played against many prestigious schools like Mazol Obek and Ahar Azmi. And most of, our, most of the matches we won in most of them. Uh, so, uh, I would say the thing that got me into volleyball was anime. <laughs> it was uh, haiku. So basically, from Japanese, it's volleyball. So it's called, called haiku. I think anybody who's uh, who's playing volleyball have watched that anime. Because if you don't watch that anime, but if you play volleyball, you're not really a volleyball fan. If you don't watch that anime, if you have never watched it. Uh, it's a must-watch thing if you play volleyball. So everybody, uh, so just like everybody, Haikyuu uh, led me um, to volleyball. Um, so after seniors left at tenth grade, there were there were like no nobody. There was nobody playing volleyball at all. 
uh, everybody was playing basketball or vol uh, or football. So nobody was really playing volleyball. And um, I came up with an idea, kind of. I opened my own club. Of, I opened my volleyball club. So uh, it was really a success, I, I would say, because I, I had like from uh, 20 to 30 students coming into my club. And we were practicing volleyball. We, we uh, did some volleyball friendly matches against each other. And after that, I formed uh, the school's team, varsity team. And then uh, slowly, we started to play in tournaments. We started to play against other schools. So I got some experience from that. And uh, yeah, I would say we won most of the matches. And for example, in the recent tournament that TIS has hosted, uh, we got the second place. Unfortunately, but it was really a close call. Like it was two one two one by sets. So yeah, volleyball is my favorite thing. I would say, and I really want to continue it when I go to, into college. Mm -hmm. The f the first thing I would I would do when I go to college, uh, when I go to Northwest University, it will be checking the gym, checking the court, and checking the balls, the mm -hmm. volleyball balls, mm -hmm. uh, and. They have like recru recruiting sessions as well for the varsity team. So I think I'll be taking those sessions and hopefully we'll get accepted into the team as well. You ever thought about taking up volleyball professionally? Ah, uh, no, never. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't want to do sports as a <laughs> professional. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you can you can do both, like be a journalist and a professional in volleyball. Nah, player. I, I don't think it's possible. I don't think it's possible to be professional in both mm -hmm. fields at the same time. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not humanly possible. Yeah, right. You put all your eggs in one basket, right? You just and be all about that basket. You so you want to put all your resources, yeah, yeah. your energy, in in most one thing. Yeah, most yeah. of it. Got it. So you like doing other things when you got some spare time, like listening to podcasts or reading books. I don't listen to podcasts, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I used to read a lot of books, but this is, uh, I'm not reading any book, but mm -hmm. I'm rather I'm watching YouTube mm -hmm. and uh, reading articles instead of reading books. So what do you watch on YouTube? Uh, Just random 50 stuff? 50% of the time I watch CS content, Counter-Strike content. Mm -hmm. Like um, we have some events like majors and mm -hmm. some events going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and other 50% uh, I would spend on like beneficial videos, like, um, I don't know, like TEDx maybe, mm -hmm. or some uh, some other like uh, videos that share some knowledge. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, like useful content, right? Yeah, yeah, kind of, you see. could say that. Sure. Wow. So, yeah, it sounds like you got, you got a lot of interesting things coming up at Northwestern University in Qatar. Yeah, hopefully, right. because you know it's located in education city. Mm -hmm. Education city is like uh, specifically built for students. Mm -hmm. They're like, uh, I think seven. Uh, no, Texas is gonna get close. So there are sixteen uh, camp international campuses of top tier universities like um, S uh, SMU or Georgetown or the Northwestern or Texas. So they have the global campuses in there. So I will, I will have like genius minds there. I, I will meet up with them, I think, hopefully. And the, uh, the cool thing is that I can take a class in other neighboring university, not only in Northwestern University. If I want to, I can take the other class from other university. At no cost, free of charge. Yeah, yeah, free of charge, free of charge. Wow, that's quite a privilege. Yeah, in the, in yeah. The, is, that, is that exclusive to all students go to... So I'm guessing it's ex exclusive to students who go to universities in that particular city. Yeah, in that particular city. You call it the city of education. education city. Yeah, education city. Is, is that, that is that even a real name? Yeah, it's it's so it's, it's a real it, name. They, they call city. the city education city. Yeah, they call it like that yeah. because it has like seven international campuses and mm -hmm. it has their own Qatar's own university mm -hmm. and schools, mm -hmm. and it has um, everything that a student might need. Uh, all right, hang on a second. Is it a dubbed name, dubbed like, like a nickname or actual name? No, it's actual city? name is Education City. It's called Education yeah, City. Education wow. City. 
And yeah. the cool thing is it has its own transportation inside it, mm-hmm. and the buses are free for every student. Wow, free so, transportation. Yeah. You can move inside. around for free. Yeah. You don't need a car. Yeah, but only inside the education uh-huh. cities, though. Uh-huh. If you, if you want to go outside the city, mm-hmm. like if you want to like explore Doha, you will mm-hmm. spend like from your own pocket. Yeah, right. But I'm guessing the city is medium sized, right? The education city. Yeah. Ah, uh, I don't know about that. Yeah. I don't know about that yet. I didn't explore the city yet. Mm-hmm. But uh, I know that it has a mosque, and I know that it has its own oxygen park. What's that? What's an oxygen park? I, I have no idea. But I know yeah. that there is an oxygen park, yeah. like. Um, I th- I'm guessing that it has some fresh air, maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm guessing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I I've searched up, but mm-hmm. I didn't really find much information. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is information about education city, but they don't go into details much. For example, uh, about the mosque, I found it out like really late because they don't provide any information about it, mm-hmm. and they don't really have much photos of it as well. Right. So I have many much things to explore when I go to there. Oh, that's something to be excited for, for yeah, sure, right? Yeah. yeah I'm, if, I'm honestly excited. in the hot climate, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot to be explored in Qatar, right? Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Sure. Uh, all right. I have one final set of questions I want to I wanna go over with you, mm-hmm. if you don't mind. So now this is the part of the podcast where we talk a little about Philosophy and stuff, oh. right? Okay. So, let's go. what do you? What's your take on life? What, what are you? What are you? What's your mission? What are you trying to do with your life? What is your? What's your philosophy? Um, help as many people as possible, mm-hmm. and um, to open people's eyes, to open the eyes of people of Uzbekistan. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I don't think that many people, like most of the people, uh, are not aware of goal problems. Mm-hmm. Even though they're aware, they don't take any actions at all. Mm-hmm. For example, the global warming, right? Everybody knows about it, but nobody does a thing to prevent it or the water usage or the any other materials, minerals, right? Everybody knows, everybody's aware of it, but nobody really takes any action. So I want to make, not, not make, but kind of motivate people to take actions and to prevent the future problems, kind mm-hmm. of. Right, as a future journalist, right? Yeah. That's quite a lofty goal. That's a quite an ambition to have. Yeah. 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 Hopefully. Yeah. Yes, we got a lot of big world problems going on, and sadly, not many people are aware. Yeah, not many people are in involved. Politics. Right. So what's one piece of advice you would have for your younger self? Don't play games, <laughs> I, I, th- I think, yeah. because uh, I used to play a lot of games. When I had the PC uh-huh. at home, I used like half of my time playing Counter-Strike, mm-hmm. but that didn't like force my time. Mm-hmm. So instead of doing that, I could like learn a thing or two online, mm-hmm. like read article or do some Coursera or do some, learn some new skills. So I would, I would suggest my young self to not to play games instead. Mm-hmm. Just l- try to learn as many skills as possible. You hear that, guys? If there are any game addicts <laughs> out there obsessed with playing computer games, yeah, you will games, regret that. You'll regret that later, yeah, guys. Get surely. up, so get up your computer and go and pick up some skills. For example, for your information, guys, I have like two thousand hours on CS on Counter Strike. Two thousand. So hours. I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So two, you better take my advice. Yeah, two thousand hours. Yeah. How many days? Is that? It's almost twenty, so hundred days. Yeah, more. Let's do the math no. real quick. It's like around thirty to twenty, more than twenty days. That that's that is that that's eighty eighty three days. Ah, uh, really? 80? Oh yeah, two thousand oh, hours in two years. Spending yeah. eighty three. That's almost three months of your life playing Counter Strike. You, you see, you see, guys. You know <laughs> what I'm talking about. Yeah, so it's not worth it at all. Yeah, okay, yeah. Your it, time is better spent on something else. Yeah. Right. You better spend it learning as many skills mm-hmm. as possible and networking. Mm-hmm. Networking good. is a good thing, guys. Yeah. Yeah. And when he says networking, this just doesn't mean no, hanging it out doesn't with mean friends playing. and no, having no. fun, right? It means being p- meaningful part of events, right? Reaching yeah, out to get people, to know people, like mentors. Yeah. 
for example, go to events, the mm -hmm. social events, the events that are publicly available to everybody, mm -hmm. say to say hi to one or two people. Mm -hmm. Nobody would kill you for that, really. Mm -hmm. But you will you will benefit that yourself. Mm -hmm. If you get to know more people, you will mm -hmm. see the aspects that are better at than others. Mm -hmm. So you might need their help in the future, really. Hel uh, asking for help, other uh, asking others for help is not a bad thing because everybody needs uh, s s some kind of a help some in some part uh, of their life, you know? Mm -hmm. So asking for help is not, a, uh, it's not a bad thing, I would say. Right, right. Because you might be one conversation away from changing your life. Yeah, yeah indeed. Turning your life around. Right? Yeah. One That's conversation away. All it takes is go up to that person. And say hi. At, say hi. Yeah. That's it. That's just how it all starts. Yeah. And ask the question on your mind. And that can do wonders. Yeah. And just get their mm -hmm. contact, like LinkedIn or Telegram. Yeah. yeah. And one final question. Assuming this podcast is right now being watched by your future self, what's one message you have to that guy, to your future self? Say How, how many years? Like, yeah. Say you're 20, you're 17 right now, right? 18. Yeah, I'll be 18 in a month. Yeah, in a month time, this guy's going to turn 18. Yeah. Now say... Your 20 year, 28 year old self looking back right now watching this podcast. So, what's something you would want to tell him? Um, S pretend he's watching you right now. Okay. You might uh, want to remember wave. that hereafter is better for you than this worldly life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Hereafter is better for you than this worldly life. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say so. that. You don't focus on the things that are. Mm -hmm that are on, only uh, specific to this world. Mm -hmm. Just prepare yourself for the day of judgment, I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah, that would be my advice to mm -hmm. my future self. Yeah. yeah, right. All right, Mr. Diorbeck, it was, uh, it, was, it was a pleasure talking to you today. And I'm really, really excited for your future adventures. You got into one of the top universities in the world. You picked a great major, journalism. The world needs more honest, better, dedicated, responsible journalists. And I hope you'll turn out to be one of them one day. Inshallah. And congrats on winning $300,000 scholarship. So do you have any final remarks you want to you make before we wrap up so, this podcast? Yeah. So first of all, thank you very, very much mm -hmm. for inviting me, for letting me in this podcast. Mm -hmm. It was really a uh, pleasure to mm -hmm. be here. Um, so um, I think that was it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I hope it was I, I don't have really much to say. I, I said everything that I could. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks a lot again. Uh, wish you all the best, buddy, and good luck on your studies. All right, guys. If you enjoyed today's content, please don't forget to subscribe, like our content, and leave your comments in the comment section below. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.